Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about supporting Hispanic Latino owned businesses and its leaders through the pandemic and economic crisis with guests. Laura Mario, President and CEO of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and Carmen Castro, Executive Director of Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber in Portland, Oregon. So we have two parts of the country. So it's just great to be here to talk about this, this really important topic at this very critical moment for the entire community, for all of America. Just to set you up, 18% of Americans' population is Latin Hispanic, and it's a group that is the second uh, fastest growing ethnic group by percentages after Asian Americans. So let's just chat about your view of how Hispanic Latin businesses function within the United States and your role in ensuring that the business community thrives. So uh, Laura, you, could, could, you, uh, could you kick us off? Absolutely, thank you for the invitation. And on behalf of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I wanna thank you. I am Laura Murillo, President of the Hispanic Chamber here and certainly very important conversation as it relates to business and the economic engine that are Hispanic owned businesses. We know that our country thrives as a result of businesses. We also know that we here in Houston, we consider ourselves the epicenter of entrepreneurship and specifically over 42% of all businesses in our city are Hispanic owned. Nationally, it's important to note that the largest growing sector of minority owned businesses are Hispanic females and that's across the country. And so we'll start there with some of those facts and figures on the national level. 42%, that's, that's just amazing. And, and also when you look at the entrepreneurship that that represents and the fact that so many of these uh, businesses are women owned, you end up with a tremendous employment boost because so much employment comes from those small businesses that are being created and that are leavening uh, uh, cities and communities. Carmen, could you talk a little bit about your very different perspective from this very different part of the country in, in Oregon? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity today. Um, the um, Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber has been around since 1994. And we serve both sides of the river, as we like to say, with Oregon and our neighboring states out in Washington. So we serve Southwest Washington and Portland. So uh, Portland has been on the news and not always for the, for the best things. <laughs> However, uh, we also have a very entrepreneurial um, spirit here. And um, I would like to say that our, you know, our businesses are not flourishing due to the pandemic. However, the Hispanic Chamber uh, has many programs, which I can talk about later for our, our small businesses. Uh, for instance, in Oregon, we, uh, our population, our Latino population is 13.4%. So we're talking from a different perspective, a perspective where folks are still getting used to having a strong Latino presence, but we are here in Oregon, the largest um, growing population in the state. Uh, we even have some uh, locations, some cities where, you know, K through 12, we have um, over 30% of the students are Latino. So we're talking for a very Latino future in Oregon. So there's, there, there's this uh, debate that, that so often unfolds in the United States in terms of the melting pot versus our different uh, ethnic groups. So let's talk a little bit about why it's important to have a uh, Latino or Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce that addresses specific needs. Uh, Laura, why is it important in a, in a tremendously diverse city like Houston, one of the most diverse cities in the United States, to have a Chamber of Commerce that is not just part of the, uh, the mainstream generic Chamber of Commerce of, uh, of uh, the greater Houston metropolitan area? Why is that important? It's about diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
we have yet, despite the demographics in terms of our population, we are yet not at an equitable place as it relates to corporate board seats, procurement opportunities, executive positions in corporations among leadership. And so we advocate for those opportunities. At the same time, we practice what we preach. I know I sent you all an op-ed that ran in the Houston Business Journal that I wrote to identify those opportunities and to put facts and figures before those leaders. Here locally, we've gathered over 40 CEOs to provide them with a white paper that demonstrates that across the country, we still only represent less than 2% of all corporate board seats. And so that is why we need advocacy groups and others to continue to have this dialogue and conversation, but we also must practice what we preach. Here locally in Houston, I've been at the Chamber of Commerce now 14 years. And when I came to the Chamber, it was a Chamber of Commerce where most of the board members knew one another and came from similar backgrounds, et cetera. Fast forward now 14 years later, our board of directors come from all walks of life. Most of them have never met one another before coming to the Hispanic Chamber. And about eight to 10 years ago, I came to the board and said, we need to diversify. We need to have non-Hispanics. And thus far we've had two chairmen who are non-Hispanic. One currently is the chairman and CEO of Cadence. He was an individual who got me an opportunity to help the chamber move into his building. It was a bank at the time that he was affiliated with when our lease ran out. And he's been involved with us for the last 14 years. He's now our chairman. We have the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield who has served with us, the CEO of United Healthcare, uh, the first uh, non-Hispanic woman to serve as our chairwoman, who was with the Texas Medical Center where I worked for over seven years. And actually she was my boss in the medical center at Memorial Hermann. And so we had to diversify not only from my, uh, uh, the different people, but also their industry sectors. And so I believe, we believe at the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, that diversity, equity, and inclusion is who we are. And the other piece of this is that we also incorporated people that were not your typical Chamber of Commerce folks. We have started, and I serve as founding president and CEO of our foundation and the Emerging Leaders Institute with young professionals, over 300 that we have graduated that we are helping develop, identify, and cultivate to take leadership positions today. And so there's a big swath of things that are falling under the umbrella of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we are driving that. We are having these conversations. We have partnered with universities, not just local, but across the country and with McKinsey and company and others to help provide facts data and information to decision makers. And so, that's why it's important. So your, your point is that in order to uh, be heard, sometimes you have to separate and talk about the specific issues that are being confronted across the board. And you're also making a very interesting point that diversity, equity, and inclusion runs both ways. It's not just a one-way street. You're talking about diversity within your board. Absolutely. You're talking about becoming an advocate in different ways in which you are not only having a separate voice, but you're integrating your voice into the boardrooms and into the, um, the management teams yes. of organizations that serve uh, uh, Hispanic consumers and serve general consumers. And basically you're trying to uh, lend your voice to having America become the America that we wish to be. Now, you have a different situation, uh, Carmen. You have a uh, smaller but, but very rapidly growing um, uh, Latin Hispanic uh, population. Are you uh, focused in the same way at your stage of development, which is an earlier stage of development, in uh, penetrating um, a whole range of different businesses? Or are you focused uh, mostly on ensuring that um, that Latin Hispanic businesses are represented. How are you functioning within your programs? So our approach is different because, as you said, you know our population drives it. So back in 1994, when the Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber was founded, it was founded 
pretty much on the idea that the Hispanics were not portrayed in a favorable light. So at that time, um, like recently, there was a lot of uh, negative narrative about Hispanics. So and that's we just saw that with, with the uh, demonization of uh, Latin Hispanic uh, peoples coming uh, from south of the border and this whole idea of using language in order to create division. So this is something that, that continues to this day. How do you counter this today? So that, that was the driving um, force for us to form. And because we wanted to provide examples of what, who we are, we're non-monolithic. Um, we know we have folks from south of the border, but all the way over to Argentina. And so we wanted to portray, to have the community see us as whole people. And so therefore this group came together and uh, we, our aim is to create opportunities for prosperity for the, for the Latino population in Oregon. So the way we, we decided to do this was to have three main programs that feed that. So we have a scholarship program and to date we have had uh, over a thousand students with scholarships, over $2.6 million dispersed in all kinds of careers. And we have partners throughout all of the community, including firms that are not Hispanic that want to, you know, to be allies. And we have uh, students in STEM careers, we've had journalism, marketing, and our students are also include first generation, which is so important. So we feed the pipeline of future leaders by funding the scholarship program. Uh, the other pillar of our um, chamber is also to have a way for small business to prosper. We know, as Laura said, that they're what fuels the economy, what sustains not only individuals, but families. So we have a, a very thriving technical assistance program. We have a team of bilingual, bicultural team members who provide this technical assistance in partnership with, let's say, uh, Clark County, the city of Portland, the city of Beaverton, Business Oregon, which is our economic development arm here in Oregon. We have, for instance, since last year, we're on pace to create 150 websites for Latino businesses. So we do this in order to pivot, for them to pivot into the digital presence that they need in order to to um, you know, thrive in the pandemic, or at least keep the doors open. And, and the, the third, third pillar? What's that? The third pillar? The third pillar. The third pillar is our leadership program. And that is a cohort-based program. So you're long, it's all Latino. Because we're fewer here in Oregon, we feel the need for community, comunidad. We need to see each other. We need to advance together. And that those are classes that are taught once a, once a month, but by all kinds of community members, not just Latinos, but many are. And we also expose them to government. The, the, the whole idea is to position emerging leaders to fortify them with connections and also with more um, academic knowledge. And so they can go out in the world and be part of the advancement that we see as a vision for Latinos here in Oregon. It's American business leaders and community leaders uh, making sure that people have the platform to thrive, right? The, the pursuit of happiness is part of the, uh, of the American system. So let's talk a little bit about um, how your uh, business leaders have fared during this pandemic time um, and how the pandemic has actually affected um, Latin Hispanic owned business and, and businesses and the, uh, the uh, impact that you have had. Um, we just completed a poll in which we found that 78% of respondents, and this is a select audience, but the uh, but 78% process that they uh, patronize um, uh, Latin Hispanic owned businesses, which is interesting, 78%. Um, I, I would think that, that in the United States, um, it would be it would be an even higher number. Um, Lada, how have has the the pandemic affected your operations, if at all, or or have you basically just uh, continued uh, as you as you were previously? Well, 
certainly this has provided an opportunity for the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to take further advantage of the, being the only Chamber of Commerce in the country with an, a media, plat, media platform on a national uh, basis with CBS. And that media platform has allowed us to continue and expand on opportunities to interview and promote many ideas and activities that are going on throughout our city and nationally to provide support services, whether it's through PPP and funding from SBA to our government leadership, et cetera. And so we've utilized that platform, which is in English and Spanish. So on CBS, we are on six stations with an audience reach of over 3 million. And on Univision in English and Spanish for those entrepreneurs and other people in our city who are Spanish speaking. And the point of that is, is that this Chamber of Commerce has continued to push through. We have found innovative and creative ways to support our sponsors to pivot, as was mentioned, to make sure that we're helping them with resources. So much so that we were named as the organization here in Houston, the only nonprofit to receive two recognitions from the Houston Business Journal as a diverse business organization in this city and for the support and resources that this chamber provided during the pandemic last year. And I was also named as top CEO in Texas along with a few others for the work that was done by our chamber in 2020. And oh. so so that's very interesting. The whole idea of using um, media as a way to shift um, how people behave. You're, so you're, you're, you have a partnership with, with uh, CBS. You reach 30 million individuals. Three million. Three million. Three million. Three million. Uh, I'm sorry. And, 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 and um, then you also deal with the language issue because your programs are, are bilingual as well. Only in um, radio and television, but all of our services are all 100% in English. And here and there, we might have something that is in Spanish, which is also a very interesting conversation to have in terms of the perceptions. I still today, in a city as large as Houston, Texas, where I talk to CEOs from all across the country, and people will still have the question of, well, do I need to be Hispanic? Or I don't speak Spanish or when we have sought board members, they identify someone within their corporation who happens to be their senior Hispanic. And our response has been, we want that CEO on our board. This is not about identifying your top Hispanic in your organization. It's about visiting, engaging, and having your top CEO on our board so that it can be mutually beneficial. And so it goes back to that thinking bigger than just Hispanic. Well, knowing and, your consumers, knowing your employees, absolutely. knowing knowing the labor pool, right? right? Yeah. I mean, you, you really do need to take advantage of talent where it resides. And talent is not aligned to ethnicity or age or gender or orientation. Talent is talent, right? Correct. So we have to be out there. And we can't be afraid of that. We cannot be afraid to open our doors to non-Latinos. We cannot stay in a silo. I've attended, as an example, conferences or these employee resource groups where everyone in the room is the same ethnicity or same gender. And they're talking about needs and opportunities. And you look around the room at a women's conference and there's not a single man. And we know yet that many of the decision members are, are men and they're not in the room. We're not talking to them. We're talking to ourselves. That's not going to work. It has not worked. Here in, in Houston and in every opportunity that we have, we engage with decision makers regardless of where they're from. And if anything, we are enforcing this idea that it is not an us versus them. We can all win in this dialogue. So, uh, Carmen, we, we were also uh, talking before the show about uh, board membership and the fact that since uh, very often board membership on, uh, on uh, corporate boards, on government boards, on nonprofit boards um, come with certain expectations. And if you have people who can't afford to just volunteer, uh, you end up tilting the the. Uh, those boards away from representation of people who have less wealth, right? And since wealth in this country so often um, aligns to ethnicity, you end up silencing voice. 
How do you deal with that issue? It's a very complicated issue, right? I mean, uh, do you do you want to be paying people for uh, serving on boards? Um, how does that actually function in your mind? How do we change those boards to ensure that there is more adequate representation and that different members of the community uh, get served? Uh, you know, uh, Mark, I've seen um, a lot of activity in the last year uh, due to recent events for, for the desire to include um, more diverse um, folks in, in all kinds of boards, not just Latino, but all kinds in order to have a more accurate representation of the community. And I think the issue of whether to pay or not to pay the board members is still evolving. Uh, but I do see a desire uh, to make sure that if, if folks are asked to serve, that there is uh, some kind of um, understanding or connection or incentive to allow all people to, to to, uh, to uh, serve um, in a way that is a win-win situation. Um, I think it's gonna be a difficult decision because although you don't wanna be entirely in a situation that is a pay for play. Right. Uh, however, in a nonprofit, that happens in a way because a nonprofit needs folks that can influence things to move issues and also help finance a small nonprofit. So you have to make allowances for people to bring talent and not necessarily money into the board uh, in order to have a diverse uh, set of opinions represented. So um, uh, Laura, when, when we're talking about uh, board membership in, in companies, right? Companies have an interest to have board members to provide oversight, uh, also to provide business advantage. Right. So how do we deal with representation as well in, in, in those situations? Right. Very often you end up with people who want to be sitting next to somebody who looks exactly like them. Right. How do we get beyond that idea? How do you, through your advocacy, get beyond that idea and connect the business logic to um, diversity so that we shift away from this idea of, I want to spend my days with somebody like me who make my life easier to somebody who is going to perhaps challenge my preconceptions to make it exciting to have these dialogues and also make it safe to have these dialogues within uh, the, uh, a board situation. So that power starts to evolve in these uh, companies in ways that benefit the community and benefit the companies as well. Well, we start with the conversation that would be important to these corporations and the reasoning behind them wanting to include minorities and women on their corporate paid boards. And that begins with the economic impact that it will have on them. We know that consumer spending, especially as it relates to minorities, would help them if they had opinions from individuals who don't look like them. So again, it goes back to the economic impact of including minorities on corporate boards. And number two, it's with data, facts, and figures. A Harvard study was recently put together that indicated that performance increases and revenues increase when women are included on corporate boards. We also know that the data demonstrates that in fact, that the more inclusivity that you have, not only on your corporate board, but at executive senior decision-making levels, you are going to outperform your competitors. So if they don't do it because it's the right thing to do, then perhaps they will do it because it has a positive impact at their, on their bottom line. Additionally, the Harvard study also indicated that it was very important to look at recent legislation throughout the country there are state legislatures now who have moved toward ensuring that corporate boards are in fact looking at and identifying and including minorities as part of law on their corporate boards. We have countries and other places across the globe that have said, you have to have women, you must have women, you must have minorities, and they're assessing fines up to $100,000 for violations. So it may become something that is posed to them as a legislative imperative versus them doing it 
because it's the right thing to do. Well, particularly in certain sectors, right? I mean, if you look at 18% of the U.S. population being uh, self-identifying as Latin Hispanic, you're talking about a huge amount of business, particularly in certain sectors um, uh, where um, where that uh, consumer dollar is incredibly uh, potent. And how do you uh, capture that consumer dollar if you don't have representation that aligns to uh, those very diverse uh, consumers? Uh, one of the questions that we received um, from uh, Ken Martinet was uh, a, a real question about the uh, intersection of business, chambers of commerce, uh, and so on, with nonprofits. Nonprofits connecting to communities in different ways. How do you both interact with the nonprofit ecosystem? Other nonprofits, you're a nonprofit yourself, other nonprofits in your communities, you both talked about scholarships, so that's understood. Uh, but do you also tap into the amazing font of talent that nonprofits provide to advance uh, your business agenda for your members. Carmen, you want to take that first? Yes. For instance, here in Portland, we recently, we've had an informal coalition, if you will, with other chambers of color, uh, because we have some of the same issues, like Laura said, procurement, for instance. It's a big issue. So um, the governor, Governor Brown in Oregon, recently formed a racial justice council. Uh, the Hispanic Chamber is part of that in the Economic Development Subcommittee. So, and other chambers uh, are part of that as well. So in many cases, we um, unite over similar issues of access, contracts, um, federal monies, state monies that are coming in, in order to uh, together uh, come in and to advocate for our communities, specifically in a pandemic year. So we do pull together. Uh, we also collaborate with other nonprofits that specialize in uh, helping small businesses as well. So there, there are all kinds of collaborations here in, in the Portland area. And we also reach be, beyond. We have a, an alliance with all Latino leaders statewide now because of the pandemic. So the pandemic did provide some opportunities for many of us to coalesce and do more. And Laura, there's there's a whole ecosystem in Houston. You have uh, universities, nonprofit universities. You have community colleges. Uh, you have workforce development organizations. Not to mention the, the various advocates and healthcare providers and, and and other organizations that are connected to business. How do you connect to the nonprofit ecosystem within Houston? Well, fortunately, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas, and I spent 15 years as an employee and an executive at the University of Houston, and then seven years in the Texas Medical Center in healthcare. And that has afforded me with an opportunity to have longstanding relationships and understanding the corporate needs, the nonprofit needs, and how to bring the two together. And so one of the things that we have done is we've established hundreds of partnerships with nonprofits and helping them not only find and identify potential board members, but connecting these corporations to some of those opportunities. And once again, the media platform of being able to highlight and showcase some of our nonprofits that typically might not get that opportunity to talk about the work that they are doing. Additionally, through our Emerging Leaders Program, where we have over 300 young professionals, we have been able to identify volunteer opportunities for them to engage and or serve on boards. So we do a whole lot in the space of partnerships. We need those non-for-profit entities to succeed. We need to support those CEOs. And it's even often sitting a CEO from one of those nonprofits because I know what they're trying to do and I know who they're trying to get next to, but they can't. So I'll find a way to make sure they are seated, for example, at the largest business at Expo Luncheon in Houston, which is hosted by our chamber, that that CEO of that nonprofit gets to sit next to a CEO where I know there's a fit and an opportunity. And this is paid phenomenal dividends for us as a leader and what we call ourselves the leader of Houston's new majority, because it's not about the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. It's about our city. It's about our country. It's about connecting the dots. And I think that has been one of the things that our board and staff has really done a great job because we need them to succeed. And as a chamber, we get all types of calls. We stay in our lane, we are mission focused, and then we refer to other entities to make sure that those 
opportunities and needs are addressed. So we're coming to the end of our time. I'd like to, you each to comment on the state of the nation when it comes to the identity of, of identity in, in the United States. Identity is, is, is so interesting um, when you think about the founding of the country and the dispossession and violence against native uh, peoples that, uh, by Europeans. You think of uh, four centuries of slavery. You think about the uh, stresses between um, uh, uh, the, the Spanish colonists and the uh, British colonists and the French colonists that unfolded in, in North America. And then you see today the, the uh, panoply of different ethnicities that comprise the United States and the xenophobia and racism that are uh, promulgated by some as a way to divide us and gain uh, political power. Uh, Carmen, if you could comment, and then you, Laura, about the future of the United States, what, is, what does it mean to be an American when it comes to uh, inclusion, uh, diversity, this whole idea of e pluribus unum, our first motto? Um, how do you see this unfolding and your contribution to creating the America we wish to be, uh, Carmen? And then, and then, Laura, if you could comment as well. You know, um, I, I think the, um, one of the, the main things is education. Uh, education of everyone being open to learn. And so I think it's very important for us as a chamber to continue to portray Hispanics as whole people not being boxed in in any particular category because we're just not Hispanics. We are learners, we're professionals, we're educators. There is so much in you know, ourselves and other groups, we're all community, but you have to be able to open yourself to that concept. Your men, and your women, American. your workers, your consumers, your lawyers, your finance professionals, you know, it's, it's, uh, the the inclusion of ethnic identity as as a fact of pride is the birthright of every American, right? But this whole idea of of listening to each other and sharing our gifts is is, is so important. Laura, how do you see uh, the future of the United States? The future of the United States is one that we believe through diversity, equity, and inclusion will be a big solution toward uniting this country. And as a Chamber of Commerce, we believe that it will also serve in the best interest of these corporations and their bottom line through making sure that minorities and women and others are part of the conversation, that we are at the table. And I want to emphasize that it's not an us versus them. It's a collective way of working together so that we can have the results that we want. Many of the things that we have seen across the country, I believe could have been avoided if we had people from different parts of the country with different voices, with different opinions that would have helped solve many of the things that we saw that have percolated over time and that we're seeing as a disruption across the country. If we wanna be a country that is moving forward and it is taking full advantage of all members of our society, I believe that it begins with making sure we have the right people at the table. And in 2021, there is no reason for us to have such a small percentage of minorities and women serving on corporate boards. So this is a great opportunity and we're optimists at the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce that through dialogue, we will in fact see these changes. I'm so grateful that you both have helped to uh, lift some of my ignorance just through sharing your experiences uh, with us. Um, Laura, uh, uh, Marilo, sorry to miss Murillo. Hey, Marillo. Marillo, yeah. you got it. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for, for correcting my, my terrible pronunciation. President and CEO of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Carmen Castro, um, uh, Executive Director of Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber in Portland, Oregon. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your vision of the United States and your contribution to making us a stronger civil society. Thank you attendees for coming. Ken, thank you very much for your, for your questions. And um, that's the nonprofit report. Everybody stay safe, mask up.